Good to see you this morning. Well, actually, I, I can only see about half of you, but this row right over here sure has some pretty people on it. But I'm glad to be with you. Good scripture reading. Uh, ladies, that young man is single. Yeah. And if you're interested, don't call him. Meet with me right after this service because I have to take a quick look at your teeth. Would you buy a horse and not look at its teeth? Or a mule? Well, isn't a precious lady worth more than a horse or a mule? Now, I didn't check my wife's teeth. And I've been paying for it ever since. Still paying for it. You know, I, I think about the wonderful sacrifice that the Baker family is fixing to make in their lives. To serve the Lord full time. To be able to study the Bible full time and to serve the brethren all the time without having to worry about a secular job. It, it's wonderful and I am so excited for them. I just really hate to see Holly leave. But we will be praying for you, Paul, and all of you. And we appreciate your dedication and your interest in the truth of God. Matthew 11. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Some of you didn't laugh. You, you don't think God has a sense of humor? You don't think God has a sense of humor? Look at this. He's got a sense of humor. In this passage, we have one of the most beautiful passages in all the Bible. Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. Jesus Christ said these beautiful words. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest unto your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. I got an invitation in the mail the other day, real nice. All of us get invitations through life. But you know, this is the most beautiful, the most meaningful invitation anyone could ever receive, and it's from the Son of God Himself. Come unto me, he says. What a beautiful, beautiful thought. The idea that we could take a sword and put it at somebody's throat and make them believe something. Even the idea that we can make you do something or make you believe something is ludicrous. We can't drive you like cattle must lead you like tender sheep. That's why Jesus in John 10 verse 11 is called the good shepherd because he tenderly, gently leads his sheep. And what a beautiful invitation to be led by such a wondrous shepherd. Now the first question we have to ask, who is this invitation to? Middle class, white, American, is that who it's to? 
Who is this invitation extended to? Revelation 22, verse 17. Whosoever will, let him partake of the life, water of life freely. Whosoever will. The invitation is to all people, regardless of race, economic status, where you live, what you look like. The invitation is to all because Jesus who gave this invitation loves all of us, whoever we are. John 3.16 declares, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. John 3, 16 and 17. This invitation comes from the very heart of love. 1 John 4, 8, God is love, and he that does not love does not know him. This invitation comes from a heart of concern and understanding and genuine caring for no ulterior motive simply because He loves you. He offers this invitation to all mankind all over this world. That's why he said in Mark 16 and verse 15, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. How he loves us. And so because of that great love and concern, these words came out of the mouth of our dear Savior. Now what does this invitation involve? Well, first of all, we have to understand why we need the invitation. Romans 3, 9 and 10 is the answer. The Scripture has concluded both Jews and Gentiles are all under sin. Verse 10, there is none. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. Not even one. How dare us look down the, our noses as someone who's not religious. How dare us scorn people. We are all in the same condition, lost. All are under sin, Romans 3, 9 and 10. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3, 23. 1 John 1 and following, we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. None of us are worthy. If a one of us in this audience gets into the streets of glory, it won't be because we deserve it. It won't be because we earned it. It will be because of the loving grace of our Heavenly Father. Because we're all lost. Romans 5 verse 6. It explains to us when we were without strength. That means nothing we could do. We couldn't do enough good works. When we were without strength in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would dare to die. But God commended his love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So who's the invitation for? Everyone, why do we need it? Because we've all sinned. It's our only hope in this world of darkness. 
what comes with this invitation? Well, look what he said in our text. Come unto me, all you that weary and are heavy laden. The burden of sin, whether confessed or not, whether tried to be hidden or not, the burden of sin weighs us down. It's like a great weight that's upon our shoulders and we can't get rid of it. And we carry it everywhere that we go. It's heavy. It's hard. That's why the writer of wisdom said the way of the transgressor is hard. And those who have chosen to forsake the Lord, you might think they're happy. They're not. That guilt of their sin weighs on them every second of their lives. And every time they look into their mirror, they see what they are and what they could have been. So he says, come to me, all ye who are weary, weary with sin, heavy laden with sin. And and look what Jesus said, I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. When you have a yoke, you don't just have one animal, you have two animals pulling equal load. Jesus will do his part, but we have to take that yoke and we have a part to play in our own salvation. That's why the Bible says work out your own salvation with trembling and fear. That doesn't mean work it out any way you think is best. That means work it out the way God says. Take my yoke upon you. Learn. This is a way of education. This is a way of learning. And you must continue to learn and grow. 2 Peter 3, 18, grow in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. We must continue to learn and to grow and to become more like this beautiful Savior every day that we live. Well, how does this call come to you? Is your little scary voice? Is it an apparition that comes through the mist? Is it some kind of better felt than told experience? And you just know it when you have it. My friends, Jesus doesn't play little games with us. He's not interested in playing little games and being tricky like that. He makes it clear. How does this invitation come to us? 2 Thessalonians 2, 14. This is how it comes. Not in some mysterious, dark manner. He says, He has called you by the gospel. He has called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. That gospel in Romans 1.16 is the power of God unto salvation. And that gospel calls us 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 12, the Bible says He has called you unto His kingdom and glory. Ephesians 4, verse 1, Walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you have been called. And the word vocation means calling. Walk worthy of the calling by which you have been called. 
The invitation comes through the call of the gospel. That's why he said to preach it to the whole world because he wants everyone invited, not just people we like and not just people who smell nice. He wants it for everyone. All cultures, all races. He wants to offer this wondrous grace to all of them. And he does that through his powerful gospel. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is alive and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword cutting asunder even the joints and the mind, the soul and the spirit and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. That powerful word, we hear it. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, Romans 10, 17. We hear it, it gets into the innermost depths of our being and we decide, do we accept or do we reject? Because from the beginning, when God made man, he said, now this is the way to go. And this is the way to have every beautiful thing in life. But he gave us a choice to choose another way, which is the way of Satan and the world. And he gives us all that choice as long as we live. So it comes through the call of the gospel. It comes through the call of the Word of God. What does it offer? Well, we've all sinned, Romans 3, 9, and 10. Sin separates us from God, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2. If we remain in that condition until we die, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9, we'll be punished for eternity. That's a condition we're in. But what does this invitation offer people who are in that pitiful condition? Look at Ephesians 2, 12. It talks about those who were out of Christ. He says, you are without God in the world and you are without hope. You think those people who go out and party all the time and just do what they want to and have no restrictions, do you think that's a happy life? Does that impress you? Does the glitter of the world impress your mind? I want you to know when those people lay down their head every night after all that partying, they have no hope. They do not have God. They're without God in the world. They're not to be looked down upon. They're to be pitied. And they too must be offered this invitation for, it's for everyone, not just the people we like and we think are good. It's for everyone. When I heard of Jeffrey Dahmer, and I read about the things that he did, I thought, a monster. How could anyone do such things? And while I was thinking that, there was another preacher not far from where Jeffrey Dahmer was in prison who went and studied the scriptures with De Jeffrey Dahmer. And he baptized him into Christ. Was he forgiven for all those horrible things? If he repented, he sure was, just as surely as I was. Now the prisoners went on and crushed his skull, but not before he was baptized into Christ. So it's for all people, not just nice little people that we think are such good citizens and such good people. It's for everybody. Because remember, there are none righteous, not even one, for everyone. So in a state of sin, 
Ephesians 2, 1 talks about those people that said you were dead in your sins and your trespasses. In a state of sin, Jesus invites us to mercy, to forgiveness, to peace, to an understanding of yourself and of your Creator better than you've ever had. He offers such peace and such love and such a beautiful, tranquil way of life. That's what, that's what this invitation offers. It offers peace. Romans 5, 1, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Philippians 4, 4, rejoice in the Lord. Again, I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Be careful for nothing but everything with, with prayer and thanksgiving. Let your requests be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. You think people that party all night when they lay down and think about what they've said and they are so inebriated they don't even know what they've said or what they've done, do you think that's peace? I've lived through that and it's not. It's anything but peace. And you don't even know what you did the night before, who you might have hurt, what you might have said, what you might have done. But Jesus offers mercy. He offers forgiveness. Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through His blood, even the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. On the day the Lord's church started, People said, what do we do in Acts 2.37? And Peter said, you repent and you be baptized to have your sins forgiven. That's the invitation of Jesus. Even those who did the most horrible thing anyone could do, which is kill God's own son, they were invited. Now, you know what? I wouldn't have invited them people. I wouldn't have invited them. I said, they don't deserve it. And how ignorant would I be because I don't deserve it any more than they did. And neither do you. It's a precious gift. It's a precious invitation. And it offers forgiveness of sins. He says to Christians, if we walk in the light as He is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of His Son cleanses us from all sin. Revelation 1.5 says He's taken us and washed our sins in His own blood. Forgiveness. That's what this invitation offers. It offers hope in a world that has lost its hope. Say what you think about politics. Say make me sick at my stomach. Say what you want. But I tell you one thing. There's one thing I know from watching all this junk. America has lost her hope. And why not? We've given up on God. What's left? Communism? Socialism? In hope of eternal life, which God, who cannot lie, promised before the worlds began, Titus 1, verse 2. Hebrews 6, 18, 19 says it's like an anchor to the soul. That's our hope. 
America has lost her hope. But God forbid that the people of God, that we lose our hope because of politics. Our hope should be as strong or not stronger than ever. We're saved by our hope, Romans 8, 24. 1 Peter 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy he has begotten us unto a lively hope again by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance undefiled, incorruptible, that fades not away and it's reserved for you in the United States of America. No, it is reserved for you in heaven We've had it good in this country for a long time. Maybe things are going to change. Maybe it's not going to be so good. Or maybe it will. Nobody knows that. But what we can know, whatever happens in this country, our hope is in heaven, not here our citizenship is in heaven, Paul said. I'm a citizen of the United States of America. It's the greatest place in the world to live right now. But my number one citizenship is in heaven. 2 Corinthians 5, 1, we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building made of God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. That's what we have. Can a politician take that away? Can Gladimir take that away? The devil can't even take it away. Nobody can take away my hope. You see, the only way I can lose it is if I give it up. Jesus invites us to a life of hope. Jesus invites us to a life of caring about other people. Ephesians 5.1 Walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us. That's a beautiful life. It's a beautiful invitation. What comes with this invitation? 1 Thessalonians 2.12 Glory now and in the hereafter what else? He has called you unto his kingdom. Colossians 1, 12 and 13. We have been called out of darkness into light. We have been transferred into the kingdom of God's dear Son. That's what this invitation offers to come into the kingdom of God. And you have two choices, that's it. There's only two of them. The kingdom of God or the kingdom of the devil. That's it. And you can't live in both of them at the same time and claim to be a Christian. You may fool people here, but the one that matters, you've not fooled for a minute. We're invited into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's what we're invited into. We're invited into His glorious church. In Acts 2, 36, the preaching was powerful. Like it used to be in churches of Christ. The preaching was powerful. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that, that God has made that same Jesus whom you crucified, 
both Lord and Christ. Now, if we're going to say it today, we'd have to say, well, there, there's a possibility here that you may have unintentionally made some rather unfortunate choices, but it's not your fault. And don't be discouraged. And we're all winners. No. That's not the way they preached. He said, I want you to know the one that God foreordained to be your Messiah, to be the Savior of the world. You have wickedly taken him by your wicked minds and you have put him to death. Preaching was meant to convict people, not to make unsaved people comfortable. When they heard this, that's what that kind of preaching does. When they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what do we do? What can we do? We've killed God's own son. Then Peter said, repent and be baptized to have your sins forgiven. And then in Acts 2, 47, those who were saved each day, the Lord added them to his church. You're invited into his church. I've often thought it was kind of funny the way it came about. If I had never been introduced to Christ and his dear church. Oh, I'd heard about his church. I ridiculed it, knocked the windows out of their buildings. I hated those people. I was told they were ignorant, and I believed it. And some of us are pretty ding-dong ignorant. And that's what I believed about all of it, a bunch of ignorant people. And I was told, don't have anything to do with them. But I met somebody who didn't care what I looked like, didn't care how messed up I was, and I was a messed up puppy. They didn't care. They just loved me, and they showed me a home, and they showed me true love and honor, and they introduced me to Christ and His church. Had they not done that, it scares me to think where I'd be right now. He invites you into His church. Hebrews 12, 28 says, We receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved. It's not just a little religious group. It's a kingdom that will be here throughout all the ages. Uh-oh. You know, everywhere you go and preach, you know, there's going to be some people who just don't like you. Doesn't matter what you do. Doesn't matter if you're kind to them. They're just not going to like you. I learned that after, after about two sermons, preaching full time, I learned that. And I learned there's nothing I could do. I should do everything I can to be at peace with all men. But some people I knew, they're just... Not going to like me. I understand that. If I was you, I wouldn't like me. I understand. But let me tell you something. In heaven, it's going to be different. We're going to be in a place where everybody really loves each other. Not just to make a show out of it, not just to say, oh, I made this visit, I made this visit, I made this visit, and I did this, and I did this, but people who really care for you and your eternal welfare. What a beautiful thing to accept the invitation of Jesus. Now, what's the alternative? Well, when you get an invitation in the mail, you know what you do with some of them? Trash it. 
because you know they don't care a thing about you. They want you to come up there and eat this meal and hear this two-hour boring speech and try to get you to buy some dumb something. So, boom. Because I used to go to those things. I thought, boy, this would be a good meal. I wanted to say, hey, don't do it. It ain't worth it. Eat a peanut butter sandwich. It's, it beats that, that stuff, hearing that for two hours. So some invitations you just throw away. You don't pay any attention to them. This is the way it is with the invitation of Jesus Christ. He will allow you to accept it. He will allow you to throw it in the trash can. He's given you that choice. He's given you that ability to choose. That's why Joshua said, choose this day whom you will serve. Would you accept the invitation of Jesus now while we stand and while we sing?